There we go. All right, so as mentioned, uh, this week we'll be covering, we'll be finishing out the second way, which talks about how to use telemetry effectively uh, and how to use that to make decisions to improve the delivery of your product and the quality of it. And then we'll be moving on to the third way, which talks about how to build a better learning culture. So um, as far as looking at the, so we, last time we talked about the types of information we should be gathering, when we should be gathering it, uh, and what those sources of information should, should look like, how to know if we're, we're collecting the right information. Now we're just gonna look at how can we use that information to make decisions. Uh, basically, you know, the book goes in and talks about how to do this with standard deviations and how to do this in non-Gaussian distributed systems. Um, that's great stuff. I don't think that's, I don't think we need to dive too deep into that at the moment. Um, certainly if you want to incorporate that in your papers, I think that's great. But I think the most important thing here is that we want to make sure that we're using, that we're just measuring things that are significant. We really want to make sure that we're increasing our signal to, to noise ratio. Um, you know, ideally we don't want to be spamming people with tons and tons of alerts. Uh, anyone on any kind of development or operations team that has alerts is likely already being given too many notifications. As a matter of fact, I'd say almost everyone working is probably already be given, anyone with a, a computer is probably be giving too, too many notifications. I mean, look at your, your inbox. How many things are telling you information you don't care about all the time? When it comes to whether or not your service is being deployed into production and you want people to be able to rally and, and get there quickly to mitigate those errors, you want to make sure that the things that are alerting people are actually meaningful and actually indicate some kind of production failure. Um, basically, you just want to make sure, ideally, it should just be things that actually cause an outage. Um, I can say today I've probably received 17 notifications from our highest level alert on one of my clients. Absolutely none of those could I A, do anything about, and B, thought were even remotely meaningful for getting the product out there. It was just things like, hey, we're not feeling good right now, or hey, we're at 25% resource utilization. That is not a meaningful thing to do. Like if it's not, if it's not something where it's, it's deviating significantly from the type of behavior you expect, or moving towards some sort of state that could actually cause a failure, it's probably not something worth alerting the entire team about. Maybe a specific sub-team, but definitely not everyone. Uh, telemetry can also be used to make deployments faster. Um, even though, you know, what we learned about in the first way and how do we can use continuous delivery to kind of push things through quickly and try to build in as much quality as we can through automated testing and, uh, you know, source control, Things are still going to go wrong in production because no matter how much you make a system production-like, it's never going to completely simulate what it's like when actual users are using it or when it's integrated with all the different systems or when things are just happening in the real world. You know, no plan survives the battlefield. And uh, when we have good telemetry data, this basically allows us to identify really quickly when a change has, has broken something. Uh, and just get get that fixed a little bit quicker. So this example here is, you know, somebody pushed a change up, uh, and it had immediately started causing errors in the log. And because the developer who pushed that change up was had access to that log and was able to just get the was able to look at this information right after the deployment, uh, they were able to really quickly see, hey, this is something that was pretty messed up, and they were able to roll it back. And then basically by having that kind of information and that kind of uh, depth of understanding uh, with your, for your developers, you're just able to actually get the features you want up there in a working condition up in production faster. Uh, this is an interesting one. So I, I kind of love the idea. This is something that comes from Google. So uh, basically the idea is that Dev and ops teams should share res like on-call responsibility. They're calling it pager duty here, um, but basically, most organizations tend to uh, have operations teams that are responsible near releases uh, to maintain sure, ma maintain the the service, make sure it's up, respond to any kind of issues, 
they're kind of waiting on pins and needles. Oftentimes, you know, that can be overnight um, or that can be over weekends. The idea most ops teams have is to rotate that around among ops staff to, to, you know, decrease the burden on any one individual. But the idea here is that developers themselves should be included in the process. And I've extended out even further because in my opinion, it should be everybody involved in the technology value stream should have, you know, every technical member at the very least uh, should be responsible for rotating through that duty. And every non-technical member of the development team should also probably resp be responsible for pairing along at some point throughout it, just so they can actually see the upstream impact of their changes and the, you know, what types of things that can cause and, and, and how much additional work that can create for other teams. Has anyone here ever actually been on call? I do overnight. I haven't either, which is pretty interesting considering I've been a site reliability engineer and a DevOps engineer. Uh, I've been pretty lucky in this in that I, I've been working for teams that have mainly always had some sort of mitigation strategy for this. Uh, and if I was on call, it, we've never, I've never really had to respond to it. Like there's nothing that's gone wrong. So knock on wood, we've, I've had some pretty good engineers I've worked with. We've I've been working mainly in the cloud, but this sounds absolutely terrible. I would not want to have to be responding overnight. I think that would be like a condition for me not taking a job. Yeah, it is. Um, so I was on call the first three years of my life after graduate as a field engineer. And where well, we have to work with people across the world. So it's like always at 2 to 5 a.m. It's like their best time. Horrible, horrible. I guess I've like kind of had to do it when I was a, a bioinformatician. Uh, we would have tools available in the clinic, but obviously like, you know, if I create a change that was being used to diagnose or treat patients, they're still only seeing patients from nine to five and that's when I'm at work anyway. So that's like, I've never had to go above and beyond, thankfully. Um, there weren't any crazy doctors at 11 o'clock at night treating people. But I, I feel for you, that sounds, that sounds like a lot, not knowing when that your pager could go off and having to have your computer with you at all times. I don't know, that would be a pretty tough way to live. Um, but if you do have to do it, make everybody on the team share that responsibility. I think that's pretty key. Um, so one of the things I think is really interesting is, uh, you know, I think these developers should, uh, the developers need to ha just have more visibility here. Like the second way is really about giving developers and operations teams more visibility into everyone's work. Um, getting ops teams obviously more familiar with the pain the developers have to face so they can host it is, is, is a big part of it. Then also getting developers to see the pain of actually operationalizing and with their product and then also even more so going with into meeting with design teams uh, and, and sitting through things like uh, you know user experience testing to just feel out what the impact of their work is I mean there's no I, I'm sure every developer out there wants to know that they're doing meaningful work and that they're doing good things nothing will prove that out better than listening to user feedback I know personally uh, having to sit in a room with user with user feedback in a limited sense. If this is every week, it can be a little bit much, um, but nothing can tell you how quickly you need to prioritize certain changes over others, or how important the quality of getting outside help if you're not sure how to do something, and then seeing the impact on end users. You know, something you might think is really trivial, like, oh, you know, this file upload takes a little bit. To, to, to load the page before it goes through there. When you find somebody in your organization who is like, you know, a really nice person who's trying to help everybody who has to wait 15 seconds before a box appears so they can upload a file and they're uploading hundreds of files every day, there's nothing that's gonna make you wanna go back to your desk faster and fix that, uh, especially when that person's uploading your files and you realize that, you know, you're just creating part of the problem for them. I've, I've run into that personally when I was doing institutional compliance stuff. Uh, for human subject research. I was like, ooh, we should probably fix this Salesforce system. This is really painful. Uh, and there was just this team of just like older women who were near retirement, who were just like, they didn't know a better way. And they were like, web pages take 30 minutes to load, right? Or I don't know however long it was, but they, it was something totally unacceptable. And they'd submitted tickets and they hadn't really been getting routed to us properly. But when we sat down and had a roundtable discussion, 
to ask people what changes they were, they just really quietly raised their hand and they were like, would this be possible to make it faster? And we were like, oh yeah, that we didn't realize anyone was using that. Oh yeah, let's go fix that. Uh, I think we got that change in, in you know in under a day. Um, this is something that I think is really interesting. It's probably difficult to convince an already existing team or an established organization to do, but the proof point that companies like Google or Facebook are able to do it, um, or really anyone that has large operations teams should be able to do this, uh, I, th I think kind of speaks to the point. So a really interesting solution to, to spreading organizational knowledge and getting developers you know, feedback in the oper 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 sorry, operationalizing of their product is just have them manage their services in production until a fixed point before they can actually apply to have an operations team run it for them. Um, that is, sounds like such a good idea to me. It's amazing. Uh, if you could, you know, developers already need to understand how their code works. They should probably understand what kind of systems it needs to run on. And if they don't, this is a great way to figure that out. Um, this model right here, this picture is depicting uh, the Google model. So Google has a series of teams called site reliability engineers, which are really under the DevOps umbrella, I'd say. Uh, they're big goal is to handle really large scale services in production and their skill set is they're like almost developers like they're kind of like failed developers at Google they they have all the skill set but they just kind of weren't quite fast enough with just the pure development work and so they understand what it takes to keep their products running at scale really really well but they're pretty much hands off uh, during the release process. So beforehand, they prep, they prep everything, they, give, they work with the team as consultants, uh, and then they let the developer just kind of handle their work to a certain point. And then after a certain period of time uh, where the features are there and they're stable, they're then just passed back to the SRE teams. Um, you know, after, after they've proven they can kind of get to that point, then the SRE teams kind of create automated tools to keep things running from that point moving forward. It's a really cool model. I think it's a thing that a lot of people in the industry are trying to do with these SRE teams. But I think the underlying principle is something that almost every organization that has an operations team, has a development team, you know, everything that's kind of above this really small startup level company can do is just have developers, you know, run what they build. And this is gonna, this runs really counter to what most developers wanna do. They, they absolutely hate running what they own. They hate it. I hate it. You know, I, I don't like, I don't want to look at what code I've been working on for, for the past year and then figure out how to, you know, add users to it or do any of those things that are failing. But that's a great way to make sure that developers make those processes as easy to use as possible if they have to have that shared pain, you know. Um, and in a larger sense, this pattern kind of works for organizations in general. The more people are incentivized by the same things, the more likely they're going to start solving each other's problems. Uh, you, you know, I, I've noticed that many client sites, the biggest problem I see is that different teams are incentivized just by different things. You know, security teams are incentivized by nothing going wrong, you know, no security risks being published. Development teams are being incentivized by how many fake points they're able to cross across their scrum board operations teams are being incentivized by how long their services are running and because each team is optimizing for those different things and none of those things are like the actual business goals of the company uh everybody's kind of playing against each other to kind of hit some like, like get fake points you know it, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. It's kind of like getting like Reddit karma or something. It's like, why are you bothering to do this? It, it's not really helping out the goal of our company. Um, one way to kind of get some direct feedback on this is also uh, and to, to get more information about your products is to build it into the release process itself or build it into the development process itself. Uh, 
So this is un, still falls under the category of the second way. Um, there are some approaches to design that can help you figure out whether or not you're meeting your business's objectives. Uh, so A and B testing is, is one of those things. Has anyone had any experience doing A and A B testing before? Uh, yeah, actually with subject lines for email marketing. Same. Well, why don't, why don't you take it away? So what did you, how did you implement that with email marketing? Because that's exactly where, where this comes from. Yeah, Floyd, how would you guys do it? Well, um, we had a client that used Salesforce for that, and they just had different um, target audiences they wanted to target with subject lines. So they used different subject lines um, for various emails to then kind of come up with a trend of what people respond better to. So that was kind of what the A-B testing was done for. How did they track whether or not people responded to it? Um, with the tracking pixels and the emails just by, I think, how many people opened the, the emails from the testing. Oh, that's so the ones that were open, you know, had higher open rates, according to them, that meant that the subject line was more en engaging or, or just better performing. Yeah, that's a, a great example of this. Uh, so the whole concept just comes from marketing originally. And even before... Uh, you know, people are able to track things on emails. What people do is use different like coupon codes. So that's, you'll see those a lot out in the wild. And those can kind of track how likely different types of marketing campaigns are able to just be converted into a sale. Um, we can obviously expand that out into uh, all kinds of things with technology, right? Like, uh, you know, we've seen, I, I don't know how many of you have, noticed Facebook does this a lot. So, I mean, have you ever had an experience where you're using one version of Facebook and you're like talk or, or somebody posts something on Facebook about, Oh, how they don't like the new change. And you're just looking at them like, what are you, what are you talking about? I think nothing's changed on this. Um, yeah. Like it's, I know Facebook changes like quite a lot. I'm not sure if Instagram quite has the same thing. Um, but yeah, you can, you can basically just route traffic to different users and show them two different versions of the same website. Uh, and then just see, you know, you can track all kinds of things like how long are they able to, you know, how long are people engaging with this website? How frequently are they, you know, actually clicking on ads? Um, how, you know, how much engagement are they having by, you know, actually entering information in? Uh, it's pretty, you know, it, this is pretty common stuff out there in, in the industry. And it can be integrated into more than just the design process. You know, obviously you can, if you're going to incorporate this, you can build uh, tickets into, the, into your sprint planning. Let's say we're going to implement two versions of a feature to track it. You can also implement this into your release process. If this is something that is important for you to increase the marketing campaign, it's something that you can ask for from your operations teams. Uh, just the ability to be able to launch two different types of product and to be able to route it over. Uh, and I think this is something that you know, a lot of mid-sized companies or government organizations might not be as aware of as an option, uh, where large marketing companies and obviously large social media companies are super aware of it and kind of rely on it to survive. So the next piece we're going to talk about is uh, basically how to review our work and make sure that we're reviewing it correctly uh, to increase quality. And so one of the first things, the first big pieces there is uh, going through and looking at pull requests. So pull up an example here. So this is from Basecamp, which is uh, kind of like a Jira competitor. Has anyone, has anyone ever used Basecamp? It's pretty popular with startups. Um, I don't like it that though. You don't like it that much? Not really. I, it just, I think the design feels a little dated to me. Yeah, it's, it's created by some people who are celebrities in the Ruby space. And because they're in the Ruby space, they're not, I don't know, I feel like Ruby itself is a little dated at this point. But it's pretty popular amongst DevOps people because they like, there's these two people, uh, Tenderlove is the one developer and the other one is DHH. They're really big Ruby engineers and they're really, really popular. Uh, amongst the Ruby on Rails community. So anyway, I, 
you know, pull requests give us a great opportunity to kind of talk over the changes we've worked on. So I can go through and I can see there have been three commits in this pull request, each of these and you know, these pull requests are all following uh, pretty standard names, which is, you know, or pretty standard practices for naming a commit, which is you want to use active verbs instead of passive, so you, or instead of past tense verbs. So you want to say like use older bundler instead of like used older bundler. You want to make sure it's it's always like a passive action, so you know that this is something that can be rolled back or added when you're doing that. Um, you can go through and you can look at the individual files. You can comment on a, in each of these individual things if they're not making any sense. So this is a pretty standard practice um, here. And then usually at the end, there's some sort of approve or deny process. Uh, I think you've had some exposure to this with our GitHub exercise. So one thing that I don't see here is this PR has no description, right? Like if we look at it, this pull request doesn't tell us really too much about it. It says, you know, this is just kind of like a conversational style, um, just saying where it came from, what it does, but it doesn't really talk, it doesn't really like talk about whether or not it meets the standards of the, of the tool itself or the community. One way to increase the, the effectiveness of these types of conversations is to create what's called a GitHub issue template or just any kind of pull review issue templates. I, I personally love these. Uh, I love when we see pull request templates on projects. I, they really, really help uh, make sure that I know everybody's following the same types of practices. So you would just go through and you know, if we want to do this, this might take a second because I'm gonna have to fork it. We would just go through, we could just write our changes in here, you know, describing our features, uh, why we decided to do it, describe our tests for it, add screenshots if it changes the functionality, and then we can just go through and we can add things to the checklist like, uh, does it follow our institutional standards? Does it follow different guidelines? Does it follow things like, uh, if it's a UI change, does it follow things like um, disability access? You know, 503C compliance, uh, things like that are, you know, really great to have. And these can just make it a lot easier to make sure that you have the right information included in each of the individual pull requests. Has anyone ever uh, had to approve or review a pull request before? Well, you all had to do like one, I think, with the GitHub exercise. So you've got a little bit of a little bit of experience. But as you're going through and you're managing teams, I think this is a really important and often overlooked step. It's something that's super obvious, like, oh, we just created a pull request and developers are very comfortable with it. You know, it just says what's gonna change, things are gonna be merged in, but it is like a great opportunity for things to go wrong. Uh, and it's also a great opportunity for institutional information just to be lost, right? Like if you have one, if you have different skill levels uh, on your team and people aren't following these guidelines and aren't writing out some sort of documentation on the changes, you can find people that aren't on the same page technically really, really trying to, like, starting to increase that gap as, as code is committed over time. So here are some code review guidelines. Um, everyone must review their changes before committing them to trunk. Uh, everyone must have someone review the changes before committing them to trunk. So that's, that should be basically every team you have. It should be developers, it should be operations, that should be security. Anyone who's making changes to the code should have at least one other person review their, their pull request um, before it goes through. And my preferred way of doing this, the way I always do it if I'm reviewing somebody else's pull review, is I will do a Zoom call with them, or if I'm in person, just go up next to them, and then I will drive. I will pull up their code, and I will explain their code back to them, and that will give that gives me a great opportunity to just figure out whether or not I know at all what it's doing. Uh, and it also is a great way to keep me engaged because if they were just presenting it to me, it would be really hard to follow along. I think, especially you know, if, if somebody knows a lot about the product and has spent a lot of time writing the code, it can be really intimidating to jump in and ask questions if you're not as comfortable with the material. 
Um, everyone should monitor the commit stream of their fellow team members uh, so that potential conflicts can be identified and reviewed. When you are working on a team in GitHub, it naturally subscribes you to that. So you get email notifications every time new code is changed and new code is added to, um, to the product. And I like to review that, like for most of the teams that I manage and are right now managing a few across different projects, I at least have a cursory understanding of what amount of work is being done by each person and the general state of those, uh, of those different repos. Just because I can literally just ch take my phone out, you know, and when I've got some downtime, just go through and look, okay, I see they've added this feature here. I might not understand every line of code, but I at least look at it enough to just say like whether or not anything looks absolutely crazy. Uh, and having everybody on your team, given the ability to do that and choosing tools that allow for that are really important. So enforcing things like subscriptions to GitHub for everybody are, are pretty solid. Uh, and email filters can be put in place so we don't kind of violate that previous rule where we don't want tons of alerts. It should be, should be a little bit different than the alert thing, you know, but it's just something that everyone should at least be able to see. You could also put it to something like a Slack channel just so people can see as new work is committed. Just so if anyone's curious, they can kind of like just look in. Nobody should be trying to hide anything because, um, you know, no, nobody should, it should be pretty judgment free if you're setting these things up right. Um, also being able to define what types of changes are going to require an outside review or are going to be you know, considered dangerous. Like obviously changing the wording of something might be pretty harmless if your application is only used by other operations teams, or it could be super harmful if you're creating an application that needs to be, I don't know, used for signing a release for a medical form, for example, right? Every single one of those changes, they need to be approved by some sort of medical review board um, because changes to them could be used to influence the patient. Like for example, when we did human subject research at Georgetown, uh, you know, you'd have people coming into our cancer center and for experimental treatments, and we had to you know, have them sign this big form. And eventually we turned that into something we put on the iPad. And we had to be very careful we didn't change any of the wording on it because that all need to be reviewed by lots of different teams because people are very concerned that any type of misleading word wording could lead people to believe that experimental treatments which are just done for fact finding could lead to some kind of like miracle cure which is just not how science works unfortunately um, so i want to share with you something about that for us right we we almost always have to have a lawyer your mm -hmm. and and that could be a hold up for a long time because <laughs> because we cannot really uh, you know, make any change without their approval and, and it depends on uh, how much work they have and sometimes yeah it could hold up something some small thing you know for for many weeks so that that, that yeah that is uh, something that I, I mean it always uh, frustrate me one of the things that can really help with that particular issue is to decouple it from other types of development. So that one specific feature could be, um, I mean, obviously for front end development, changing things like color or other pieces could, yeah, yeah also need those types of reviews. Um, but it's kind of, you can still isolate it from some other things like the not, like if you have a decoupled backend that serves up the information versus the presentation layer, only the presentation layer needs to be reviewed by the lawyers probably. So the more you're able to decouple those things, so work can still be done. And the more that you can put the work closer to the people that have the good relationship with the lawyers, the better, like using things like uh, content management systems, like, like uh, WordPress, for example, can really help that or, or Wagtail if you're using Python and Django. Uh, but yeah, that can really slow down work a lot. Yeah, uh, we we I've run into that quite a lot. I've actually in that same job at Georgetown. I remember we would have like thirty to sixty day meetings just about the wording for how researchers would submit <laughs> their various compliance documentation. And I thought that was that was actually like 
the point where I started getting more involved and how I eventually uh, got promoted in that department. Cause I would just, eventually I just got so frustrated with hearing all of the different people arguing over just the individual wording of a, of, yeah. of a, a form. Like it, it really didn't matter for the researchers themselves. As long as they, if they didn't understand it, they could just call the compliance office and that would take way less time than a weekly meeting for two to three months. Uh, so I, I feel your pain there, but there's, there are ways to kind of mitigate that problem and, and move it, um, and kind of isolate it away from the other traditional development work. Fortunately, some of that is, is, is going to be required no matter what. And we'll talk more about change approval I think, next week when we talk about culture. So if someone submits a change that is too large, <laughs> that's other, another good review, no reason um, for, for code review changes. Like if I see anything that's over, I don't know, maybe 50 lines of code in a change, unless if, no, if, it's, if there are 50 lines of code, the entire team, I want looking at it. I want, I want this to be like a presentation to the group, like maybe even to the larger development community. Like, what did you do? How did you do it? Why did you do it? Because anything more than that is going to be really, really confusing. And it's going to be really hard for other people to ingest on their own um, without somebody there asking questions. Ideally, if you're tracking your work correctly, it should be atomic enough that there shouldn't be a need to write out really massive pieces of code. Like remember, one of the principles of the first way in continuous integration was to create work items that could be merged into trunk in less than a day, right? Trying to create really small fragments of work. If you have something really massive that's being like a big massive code change, this means somebody's probably been off working on their own, probably well intentioned, but working on their own and hiding it for a while and is just dumping a change on. In some places, if your culture's not ready for it, it's kind of needed. I mean, I think we've all been there in some big organization where you wanted, you knew something needed to change, no one was gonna do anything about it, asking for permission wasn't working, and you just kind of had to go and do it, right? You're like, this should all be automated. People don't understand what I'm asking for, I'm just gonna go and build it. Um, it happens sometimes. If it does happen, that needs to be a process that gets everyone involved and you need to make sure other people understand it because you don't want one, one person who did that feature to be a constraint because they're the only person who can support it. And two, you don't want to be that person who's the only one who understands how to do something. And now you can't move out of that position and you can't go on to do more interesting work for you because you've already solved that problem. Solving that same problem again and again, isn't going to be very interesting for you or most people. So, so what are some of the ways we can do code reviews? Um, you know, we've talked about, I think all of these at this point, uh, pair programming is great. I absolutely love pair programming. It might seem weird to people at first. It can, it can, it can kind of rub some people the wrong way, but having somebody sit next to another person, usually what you do is you have one person drive and you have another person kind of like talk about direction or do the fact finding or do the Googling. Um, that is one really great way to get things done. Uh, the other way is to have two different people like actively typing into the same console that uh, there are some tools that you can do use like uh, Visual Studio Code for that. Um, another way is one person could be writing the feature. One other person is writing the test for that feature at the same time. Uh, that's another great way to pair program and just make sure the information is being shared in between. Uh, it's great to spread out your information. It does have an initial cost because it looks like things are going slower because there's two people on one individual card. Uh, you know, rather than each person having an individual card, there being lots of work in progress. But I have found that this is what makes quality in the quickest overall. Um, I also don't think you, uh, you can have three people in the pair programming. I don't think more than that's ever effective. And I actually think whenever you have more than two, you probably, it's probably not being all that effective anyway, because one person's probably not listening. <laughs> that's, that's been my experience every time. So should you rotate, let's say you change the partner once in a while, so to get, otherwise, you know, if, you, if you are with one partner for many years, then, then you get to know each other for too long, but you don't, at the same time, you don't know the other person. So should, should you rotate uh, partners? 
I think six I mean, months a year. Yes, obviously. Like maybe less than the. I would say you should rotate partners per issue, right? If one of if your whole team's working on only one issue, I I've run into pieces where we'll have two people work on entire epics. I've been the person who's done that. Um, but as a result of it, at the end of it, uh, when I'm not working on the epic, I come through and then I'm like, wait, how do we authenticate this application? How do we do all of that? Like even if they've presented it, there's just a limit to how much you can pay attention if you're just not actively engaged with another human being, right? It's just the nature of our brains. So I think it's important to just rotate pretty often um, and also to make sure skills are shared. I mean, I know the best way that I have of learning something is to teach another person. You know, I know that like, I know if I'm, if I really understand, it's the same thing why on pair programming or one code reviews, I like to teach the other person what they did because it's how I know if I know it. I have no, you know, I'm asking all the right questions and I'm just kind of pulling it back through. You should also rotate, if you're not changing people, you should definitely change who's driving, like who's actually typing each time. Uh, if you don't, you'll run into the same problem. One person will get really good at just writing code and the other person will get really good at Googling things. And you really want people to, you want to cut, you want to try to honeycomb. You want people to try to converge a bit on, on skill sets. It won't, it won't be perfect, but you definitely want to be able to pass the work around because people get sick, people uh, go on vacation, people leave jobs. There's, there's lots of reasons to share the responsibility. Also, people just get sick of working on the same thing all over and over again. You know, that's solving new and interesting problems is something I think that we as humans just respond well to. Um, and if we don't, I think it starts to rub us the wrong way. I, I, this email pass around idea is a great one. Uh, like that's basically, I, I don't think you should just like email the entire team and say, hey, this is good or this is bad. That seems super passive to me. I like the idea that I mentioned earlier where it's a subscription model and everybody can, it basically has visibility into what's going on. Um, and those that are interested should. And I, I think you can expect most people who are checked in on a team will probably be looking at it, at least for things they find relevant um, for one reason or another. I, I, you know, I know that this has always been something that's been pretty interesting for me, uh, even before I was managing other people. The tool assisted code reviews are interesting. Um, these are basically just talking about ways that they can be done. These are, we should always be using one of these. Uh, like I, I think printing something out and passing around or emailing people changes would be really silly. I, I'm just assuming that anything you're doing is going to come through some sort of source control management tool. If your source control management tool doesn't have a code review feature, pick a better source control management tool. It's 2020. Um, that is, I think that for that one. So we've already talked about the pull request templates, jump the gun on there a little bit. And that was the second way before we jump into the third way. Does anyone have any questions about how to make sure information is being passed between developers and operations teams and basically all of the, the product teams, uh, the software delivery product teams throughout that process. Yeah, I, I think it's not necessarily mind blowing stuff, but it is good stuff to codify and to think about and describe these states for because a lot of organizations aren't doing it. And there's really, you know, there's some realistic reasons why they're not doing it. But there's also a lot of real good reasons why they should be, why they should make changes to, to move towards that and why it's important. Uh, so the third way is all about creating um, something called like the improvement kata. So I think you remember from the Toyota method, they have these different katas for practice and getting things done. This one is based off of the improvement kata, which means throughout our daily work, uh, we should have some sort of process for baked in and prioritized continual learning. So the high level principles of the third way that we'll be discussing uh, today and on Friday are we want to be able to establish a just culture to make safety possible. Um, we want to be able to inject production failures um, into our process to create resilience. We want to be able to convert local discoveries into global improvements. 
and we want to be able to reserve time to create organizational uh, improvements and learning. So, injecting learning into daily work uh, can be difficult. There's a lot of different components to it. This is what we'll be focusing on for the most part today, uh, for the rest of our time here. Uh, the first part of that is really just making sure that we have a just learning culture. Uh, and the way to do that is we want to be able to schedule, uh, you know, we want to be able to also make sure we have blameless postmortems. Um, we want to make sure that those postmortems for when incidents or accidents occur uh, are widely published and distributed so other people can access them. We want to make sure that we're always looking for new signals for failure. So just resting on our laurels. Uh, we want to be able to uh, make sure that we have a culture that doesn't see failure as a stopping point, but, may, but maybe an opportunity. And we want to make sure that we can simulate error by, by actually just causing it, right? Seeing, seeing what happens when things go wrong. And a great way to do that is to also practice things like game days to just rehearse failure scenarios and see what, what happens with them. I'll talk a little bit about experiences through that. So I adjust learning culture. I like this quote here a lot from the book, which is when responses to incidents and accidents are seen as unjust, it can impede safety investigations, promoting fear rather than mindfulness in people who do safety critical work, making organizations more bureaucratic rather than more careful in cultivating professional secrecy, evasion, and self-protection. I have a, an example of this um, that I think is pretty interesting. So two different incidents occurred uh, at my employer. So the first one was, these are both, these both, ha both happened years ago, but the first one involved, they both involved the same thing happening, which is we have our AWS accounts and in our AWS accounts, um, people had accidentally published their access keys to AWS, which allowed, which once discovered, allowed outside parties to start creating resources in our AWS accounts. Now, why, why would outside parties want to start hosting things in our AWS account? Anyone think of any reasons for, for that? Bitcoin mining. Yup. Crypto <laughs> mining, right? That's the biggest one. So both of these incidents were discovered uh, by me getting an email pretty much first thing on the way to work just saying like we've hit our EC2 limit for every region, you know, from US East to like Singapore. And I'm like, we are top, we don't have any work outside of the United States. What the heck is going on there? So you just see these giant, massive virtual machines that are used for like scientific research that are, you know, $5 an hour, just massive things running at full capacity in each of our different accounts. The way these things are discovered uh, are pretty interesting. So basically, these are types of cyber attacks. They are usually conducted by foreign, by foreign governments, actually. So both of ours originated from China. Uh, they're like, you could tell because we could track the IP down end of it, and it came from something called like the Chinese Research Institute, which is a really great name for like uh, a state level hacking agency that just monitors different GitHub organizations and publicly exposed IPs to look for this type of information specifically, because it happens pretty frequently. You know, um, developers accidentally check code, code in, you know, both new and old. So that's the situation, happened twice, right? Uh, each time was about a month apart uh, before we came up with a mitigation strategy. The first time, it was a junior engineer. Um, and this was my fault, totally on this one. So junior engineer I was working with, uh, I was pretty busy, he kept asking me for some help. He wanted to learn about AWS and he wanted to learn about DevOps. So I asked him to create a Jenkins server. Uh, does anyone remember what Jenkins is or what Jenkins does? Uh, it's, a, it's a continuous delivery tool, one of, the, one, one of the more popular ones out there, right? Right, so it being a continuous delivery tool, uh, something that's used to check out our code, uh, build the code, push the code up to some kind of secure repo. Change control. Yeah, do change control and release things into production. 
it usually has access to everything. everything. Right. Yeah. It has access to all the stuff. This is like wow. your master control center. Um, you can create ones without it, right? So usually if I'm creating a demo one, I don't give it access to anything, right? I just give it some, some basic stuff and let it go. Well, anyway, I wasn't really thinking much. This guy is just, you know, uh, he's messaging me here and there. And I'm like, I don't know. A great opportunity would be create a Jenkins pipeline. So launch a Jenkins server, set it up. And the next thing, use that Jenkins pipeline to launch an ECS cluster, which is a, a way to host Docker containers that's native to AWS a competitor with Kubernetes. And, you know, I just wasn't thinking much. He'd be asking me random questions like, oh, hey, uh, what should I do for the login information? And I was like, um, you know, if you don't make it publicly accessible, you could just remove the login information as long as only you could get to it. And I was giving him the piece of advice, but I, what I wasn't doing was checking to make sure he did it, right? Or that he understood what I was actually saying. And this was, a, you know, a 22-year-old engineer fresh out of Virginia Tech, super bright guy, but super bright and super cautious are different things. Um, you know, cautious comes with experience. And so he's been doing this for about two weeks. Uh, and all of a sudden, well, first of all, we get the alert, see all the EC2s up. Uh, I go in and I look in that cloud trail log. Remember, I showed you that. We're looking at monitoring tools that could, where I could see every single API connection. I could even see like when we logged in and I just looked who's launching these EC2s. And uh, I found the API key and I looked for it and I was like, who is this tied to? Uh, and luckily in this situation, the engineer had just used his own personal key and he'd passed that to the Jenkins server. Um, or actually, no, he'd given the Jenkins server a role and I was able to see the role in the box it was attached to. That doesn't matter as much. Anyway, I was able to tie it back to this instance and I was like, oh, this is bad. So the first, you know, we went through, I grabbed the engineer, he and I sat down, we figured out what was going on. He took accountability, you know, we're working with our operations team. We solve the problem, we plug up the holes, we get rid of all the things, we write up our postmortem, we deliver it. CTO of the company comes in and he's like, so what happened? Because <laughs> this thing cost him like $60,000. Him personally, this was a, a lab account, not a production account. And it was tied to his credit card. Uh, so, I, uh, you know, we were pretty terrified. Luckily, you know, so I, you know, I, I'm thinking, well, he's probably not going to fire me probably. Right. Like, <laughs> like, so I'm like, it was my fault. You know, Walter was working on these things. I've, I, you know, I should have probably taken, uh, you know, I probably should have been checking to see what he was doing. We fixed it. This is what we can do right now. Um, you know, I'll let you know, we're going to come up with a strategy to deal with this. And we did, we came up with a way to make sure that the roles could only be attached to instances that weren't publicly accessible. We, we solved that problem. Um, luckily our CTO is a friend of Gene Kim who wrote the, the DevOps handbook and he just sat down and said, well, what did you learn? And that was when I knew I was at a good company. That's what made me stay there until now. He was like, well, what did you learn from all this? It wasn't like. You know, it wasn't whose fault is this? He's like, well, what happened? And then the next piece was, wow, that was a good learning opportunity. And I was like, oh, that's a $60,000 learning opportunity that I don't have to pay for, but all right, pretty good, <laughs> pretty good example. But that really changed the way uh, that the whole problem went down, right? Like we didn't stop being afraid to take chances. Uh, that engineer went on to become a DevOps engineer. He went on to do some really great projects. Uh, he no longer works for our company, but you know, he left with a great recommendation for me. He's working at a, another company where he's, he's pretty happy learning, working with some new tools. It's a great opportunity and a great experience. Uh, even though it ended in failure, it was like, you know, uh, and I think we talked AWS down to make it only like a $10,000 bill. It was like a $10,000 lesson, you know? And if you think about it, the cost of engineers, uh, that's could have been a lot, you know, you could, it could take a lot longer for some people to learn how to actually build security into their products or how to, you know, launch these types of servers, it, you know, it actually wasn't that bad. I mean, considering, you know, that incident alone, I probably think, and the reaction to it is what turned uh, that engineer from a low level engineer to like almost a senior engineer. He really did gain the skill set after that from troubleshooting the problem, sitting through it, owning the solution, 
owning the problem, you know, we worked together on coming up with a way to mitigate it. Like I, after that, I felt pretty confident putting him on anything. Like I was like, all right, this is your guy. You need some work like this. He, he's the one to go to. I, I've never seen anybody own a problem quite that well. Another example of it, uh, <laughs> we had just hired somebody in super senior. Uh, I hadn't hired the person. This was before I had my current job where I was responsible for hiring the DevOps engineers. So not to like wash my hands of it, but like this was one of the reasons that I did get my position. Uh, we hired a guy who came from another uh, large banking company and he'd been like a senior manager uh, in the DevOps space there. He did the exact same thing. So we were telling him he needed to get hands on, he needed to have hands on experience to work on projects. He launched a Jenkins server and he did uh, something that was actually a little bit worse. He made it publicly accessible and he plugged his own personal AP, like pass, username and password basically into oh. this box and made it publicly viewable. Like anyone that could find this IP would just, could just look at it, right? And same thing happens, EC2's everywhere. I get the alert, I'm working with the operations team uh, and just trying to figure out what's going on shutting all these things down. At this point, I've got that pretty down. I'm just, I just immediately kill it. We're going through trying to figure out the problem. In the meantime, uh, I, I mentioned this guy, it was probably his thing. What he did is he started delete, trying to cover up his tracks. He deleted the server, even though we already knew what happened, right? He started freaking out, he started blaming other people. He tried to blame the guy, the junior engineer, right? So he's trying to do all this, the same thing. he's blaming other people. He took. I removed his AWS access, even though he was more senior than I was. I was like, no, like you're, until you get some training, you're not allowed to go into AWS. Like, I, sorry, sorry, friend. I had like buy-in from the whole operations team. I, you know, I went through, I, I reported this to like the supervisors. Uh, it was, I, and, and I had the call with him where I was like, hey man, I think this is a great opportunity for you to just get, you know, an AWS certification, learn how to use this. Uh, it looks like he kind of made some mistakes there. This wasn't his first time handling situations poorly. His response was he brought in a bunch of junior engineers into a room. He just yelled at them. He blamed them for it and blamed them for a bunch of other things that were, they were completely unrelated. It was just the project he was in charge of. He just started yelling at them for random things. He lasted about a week <laughs> after that. Um, it was a great example of if we had kept him in place and kept that kind of culture. He, we didn't fire him. He just, nobody wanted to work with him after that. And you could just tell. He just moved on and on his own, really. Um, but he had been creating a culture where it was all about blame. And maybe he'd just been used to that in the past where, you know, people were just going to attack him for it. But honestly, if he hadn't covered his tracks, I probably wouldn't have removed his access and I probably would have just worked with him to make sure he understood what was going on. Um, and that, you know, I think it's really, that those two stories kind of like highlight the importance of the way that we react to things going wrong, right? If something goes wrong, you have to you have to own it. And you have to also create a culture where when people make mistakes, they feel comfortable telling you about them. Um, and they feel comfortable that you're going to work with them to try to mitigate those problems. Not that people don't have personal accountability and ownership, but that they're, they, they actually have more and that they understand they're in a safe environment that when accidents occur, um, you know, it, I'd say it probably wasn't an accident when the senior guy decided to start deleting his own resources to cover his tracks. That's kind of where it jumped over into the, the bad line. But when an accident occurs or somebody just does something because they just didn't know any better, you, you have to kind of take it as an opportunity to improve as a company because it's probably not that they failed specifically. It's probably that your process failed. It reflected on us. We didn't have anything in place to catch that. We didn't have proper supervision of our junior engineers. You know, that really was my fault. I was giving him instructions, but I wasn't checking it. Like, that's a really dangerous thing to do for a new engineer, right? He's trying his best. He's working fast um, and breaking things, and it, it's what happened. And that's what we want. We want to encourage moving fast and breaking things. We also want to make sure that we're building a culture where that's safe to do. Um, so, you know, instead of naming, blaming, and shaming, we want to see all of these like accidents and incidents just as an opportunity for organizational learning, uh, just like our CTO Jeff did in that, in that situation. Uh, I thought that was a pretty, pretty great approach to it that he had. Uh, I never heard anything about it again. I never felt like that was held against me. Matter of fact, he promoted me. I was, I was surprised by that. Um, 
And we want to reinforce that the more that we can expose problems and the more that we can share those problems. So it's not only not blaming people, it's also just like spreading it out like, hey, I noticed that I did this thing and it broke everything. Here's why it broke everything. <laughs> you know, don't do this. This is, you know, this is a really bad thing, but like this is what you can do to make sure it doesn't happen again. The more the organization understands those things, the more that you can create a culture of building mitigation strategies. You can absorb those discoveries from the broken process. This doesn't have to just be like security issue. This could be all sorts of things. It could be adding a line of code that deletes a database. It could be anything uh, that leads to degradation of the product. So another great way when things go wrong to, to handle that and create this culture is to have blameless post-mortem meetings. Does, does anyone do this at the moment? Yeah, we try to, the few post-mortems that I've seen, we try to, you know, definitely make them less about uh, finger pointing and more about uh, opportunities for improvement overall. Yeah, I, I don't know how, um, how we can uh, change it in the government, you know, in the government is surely, uh, there's a lot of finger pointing, you know, when, when, so uh, I, you know, every time that, uh, I mean, this is a really good concept and every time that I learn something new like this, I, I, I always, always have a question for myself, like how can I apply it to the I work and uh, because in the government, you know, whenever this is a problem, we have to do a report. Like uh, the port, of course, they want to identify identify who did that, you know, when they did that, what exactly happened, you know, what was the impact? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I would say yeah, because I, if if I think about it, actually, a little bit more, even though the conversation might not seem finger pointy, you know, when you're doing a root cause analysis, you're by definition figuring out what went wrong or who did something, who did what wrong. Oh yeah. So. In neither situation, I should mention, and I did perhaps mention this in the. Uh, the story I told, in neither situation did I mention to any other members of the development team or impacted teams. The only person who knew was the CTO because he, and I tried to protect it, he was just like pretty much needed to know. He wanted to know, so eventually I just told him. But in neither situation did I tell anyone on the other teams who created the problem. That's not important information. The most important information is what caused the problem and how do we keep the problem from happening again? Everybody makes accidents. If everyone has accidents, it happens. It's, if you're not, if there aren't accidents on your team, I don't know, what is your team doing? <laughs> you know, like everybody's doing it right all the time. You're probably not doing anything interesting. I don't wanna work on that team, to be honest. I don't feel like you're experimenting. I don't feel like you're, you're innovating. It's not something I would find very interesting. Getting it to go in the government is hard. And I think we'll, we'll talk more about this when we talk about culture next week. Uh, the, one of the big models is, you know, we talked a bit about the strangler pattern where you just take one small thing and you create a model of it and then you just kind of slowly convert things to it. I can say in the government, I've had the most success with just doing it on projects that I work on. Like, for example, uh, you know, I've managed a small scrum team uh, of DevOps engineers. I've just started doing it internally and then organizationally, they might have some kind of like big blamey thing. Uh, and I'll just respond back with like, whatever I, you know, wh whoever caused the incident was me because I'm the leader, right? And what happened is the important part. And then I send out an email to the entire department or, you know, everybody on the technical side of it that just says, here's what happened. You know, I don't mention who, here's like how it happened. I just go through and create it myself, right? Like, hey, just so you know, here's a link to the documentation for what went wrong here. You know, why we had that outage the other day. Here's the lessons learned. Uh, you can see, you know, when it occurred. You can see the, all the details. And that just kind of, it, it, it removes all the power. I know we can really hold it over you if, like, you've just kind of given it all away, right? You know, you're, it makes you, it also makes you look more capable, right? Like, I don't look like I'm hiding things and, I'm try, and I don't know what I'm doing. I'm like, yo, I totally didn't know what I was doing. Things broke, but here's what we did and here's how we fixed it. You know, I just think it's, it's, a, it's something you can do in any organization. The way to do it, if you feel like you're pretty locked in already, is to create a smaller model, uh, you know, within your control and just try to model the right way to do it. You know, take, take on that as a leadership role. 
So tying two things together that you said, and sort of in my experience, uh, when we had one of our major deployments at the end of last calendar year, um, you know, a full month before we did that, you know, it was one of those like legislative mandated, you got to get it right sort of things. Yeah. And, uh, um, and we did uh, several, I think it was three weeks worth of tabletop exercises where we went through like everything that could go, what happens if this thing that could go wrong goes wrong, what will we do? Um, and it led to, you know, a, a fairly smooth deployment. Uh, but I think it, it just also helps arm the whole blameless postmortem, right? Because you already practiced the things that could go wrong. So when it goes wrong, and you just really go into executing how you fix it instead of trying to figure out who screwed it up because you already thought about it. It could have gotten screwed up. Yeah, I, I love that. That's, a, that's kind of that idea behind game days. Mm -hmm. You know, like, all right, what if, what if we were going to launch this? What would it look like? You know, how, what could go wrong? How could it go wrong? What, let's, try to make, let's try to simulate it going wrong and just see how we respond. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I love that. We do those actually to capture government work uh, at my at my company, we'll, um, you know, the, the new way of getting projects is they do things called technical challenges. I, I'm sure some of the, you that work with government organizations have some familiarity with those. But for those that don't, in the past, in order to get government work, uh, for most organizations, you would just write a proposal and then somebody would say that they really like the sales guy that was there and they'd really like the words on it and somebody would give a really cool PowerPoint presentation, maybe a few developers were there and they just kind of feel good about it. It sounded good uh, and they'd have, you know, that would be how the work would be attained for multi-million dollar projects. What's changed is the government has recently started implementing, you know, over the past few years, things called technical challenges which are basically like a game day that's assessed by the government where you go in and they give you a problem and you have to build the solution. And that means demoing not only your solution, but your management approach too. Like we have scrum masters who are going up and doing mini sprints, like sprints that last six hours, right? Or actually we'll do two sprints. So like a sprint will last like two hours and then we'll have like a retro and a bunch of other things and another sprint will last two hours. And it's crazy and it's so stressful to prepare for those things. But I'll tell you what, uh, when we get onto the project, because we've had a chance to interact with the teams and we've, we've secured them, and because before we do those technical challenges, we spend a month just like pulling the people who need that and, game, and doing game days for it. We're like, all right, we make them pretend to do everything. Like you have to get, you have to be escorted by one of our fake government assessors who is just like me or somebody else who's been on some of these tech challenges before. You usually get escorted by one of them to go to the bathroom, like you wanted a DOD site. Like it's, we, you know, we have to bring snacks in, we bring our own Wi-Fi via hotspots. Um, but because of that, we're so much better prepared when you go in. Cause like, if you, if you didn't, so many things could go wrong. Like you couldn't have power or you might not have Wi-Fi. You don't know what the situation is going to be like when you go in. Uh, and, but recreating something similar to it can really help you get a lot closer there. Right. I've been on an evaluation panel, one of those uh, on the government side. So, uh, and, and, uh, and I will say the one thing is that you, you, not only do you get to see it when, when it works well, but, the, but it's, you, sometimes you learn even more about the team when things don't go well and you watch them see how well they work together to figure it out or, or crash and burn. Oh yeah, I watched a team, uh, <laughs> I think we were able to hide it from the assessors, but uh, on one of the teams there were two people who were literally fighting in front of the things because they like seemed to completely forget what we were doing or who we were in front of. And they were just like starting to blame each other. And like, thankfully, you know, myself and another senior person just came in and we were like, all right, put them on other sides of the room and uh, we're going to pair up with them. And we're going to solve the problem. Like, cause they were, they were just not listening to each other about how to do a pull request. It was crazy, but yeah, those are, <laughs> yeah if they've been paying attention they would have probably been like i don't know maybe we don't want these people <laughs> right we thought we'd lost it actually because um usually at the end there's like an hour to present and ask questions and they just had no questions for us whatsoever but it turns out they just like wanted to go to happy hour and we totally got that project it was the weirdest one i've ever seen anyway that's the side um yeah technical challenges are are a great real world game day exercise. Um, so conducting blameless postmortem meetings, here's just some guidelines on it. Um, you know, we've talked about a bunch of these already. 
constructing a timeline and gathering details um, and getting like multiple feedback on what people think went wrong is great. Uh, don't punish the people that made mistakes. Like really don't, it doesn't help anybody. It won't reflect well on you, it won't reflect well on your organization, it won't reflect well on your ability to handle change, it won't reflect well, uh, well on your ability to adapt to change. It's just a bad idea. People that make uh, honest mistakes are just experimenting and they're trying to do the work and they're trying to learn. Give them those opportunities. Um, and allow people to speak freely and openly. Uh, empower them to, to make the changes they need and, and to, to rise up and speak about whatever was wrong, even if that process, the problem was you, right? Like, oh, hey, you created a process that, you know, I felt like I had to work really fast and I was locked in. I want to hear that. I want to know, right? If that's, if that's what happened, I want to, I want to know it. Um, I enable and encourage people who do make mistakes to be the experts who educate the rest of the organization. That's a big one, right? Uh, when people make mistakes, have them own it and have them go through and make this an opportunity. Every time somebody makes a really big mistake, I usually have them do what's called a brown bag presentation, which isn't on, they usually wind up including their mistake, but that's not usually my requirement. It's more like, all right, cool. Well, I'm excited to see what you come up with the fix for that. And then when you do, could you, you know, could you present that to like the larger community, to like, to like our entire department and just show people what you've learned? Cause it sounds like we could all learn something from that. Um, and that kind of turns it in, <laughs> nobody really wants to do that presentation. But usually by the end of it, they're pretty proud of themselves and they actually you know, challenge themselves to really make sure they understand the solution. Um, and uh, you know, remember that, I guess this, this part about discretionary space where humans can decide to take action or not um, is, is just always one of those pieces. You know, things are moving fast, people make judgment calls, uh, none of us are perfect. I think if, if each of us had even a 30% uh, you know, a, like rate of being right, we'd probably all be millionaires. You know, it's just the way of the world. I think I stole that from like an Andrew Carnegie book, but um, you know, we're human, we make mistakes, we learn from those mistakes and that's how we, that's how we build success. Um, also another good part is just to talk about what could you use to mitigate this in the future. Uh, and like just, you know, basically talking out the solution Having the person who, who, who caused the failure be one of the key contributors to figuring out the solution and presenting that. And then making sure that all of the people on the right are in the room. So the people involved in the decisions that led to the problem, like, hey, who wanted that feature out there that broke everything, right? Um, the people who originally saw the problem, like how do they see it? The people who responded to it, because it could be something on a completely different team, right? Um, those who eventually did figure out what was going wrong, uh, and the people who are affected, uh, and then pretty much anybody else who might care, right? If you can get all those people together, it's going to really clear the air on what went wrong in the problem. It's going to keep it from being something that people are like, you know, using to lord over other people for the rest of the process. Uh, and then this is just on publishing and distributing them. This is just really some examples of things that could that should be captured in the email. So any relevant JIRA tickets or, or, or log items, any relevant commits to code could be used like for the problem. Um, whether or not the problem was due to a scheduled or an unscheduled change, that's usually pretty good. Was this planned work? Was this unplanned work? Um, you know, who's, who's owning that, that post-mortem? Uh, you know, like who can they ask more questions on basically? Uh, and then just like links to any kind of posts complaining or, or discovery for the problem are usually pretty big. It could just be logs. These are just, again, examples of things you might want to distribute uh, when you're publishing your findings for those postmortems. The next piece uh, of trying to create a learning culture is just trying to find ways to amplify signals. So a big theme we run into is trying to identify constraints and elevate them. Uh, so you, you, you want to understand your process really well. The more you understand your process, the more likely you're going to find constraints that hold up the flow, the fast flow of things through your process. Um, this is just a reminder to keep iterating through that, uh, that that is a continuous process. A great example of, of this uh, is basically, so with complex systems, even unrelated things could become failure causes if you're, if you're not aware of them. So you should always be looking for new signals. A good example of here is uh, Paul O'Neill at Alcoa. Has, has anyone heard this example before? Does anyone know about Alcoa? 
No. Uh, so Alcoa was this like aluminum manufacturing company. This is a pretty famous project management example. Like you hear a lot about this in MBA programs. Uh, you'll hear about this in, I'd say like if you read five organizational management books, it'll come up at least once. Um, basically this guy, Paul O'Neill, who had come from uh, I believe government auditing and he'd done a bunch of different random things, was given this role as the new CEO of this company, Alcoa, which wasn't doing very well. He had a really hard time getting a product to market quickly. And the first thing he did when he came in, everyone was expecting him to want things to get out the door faster, is he said, we're going to remove safety accidents to zero. We're gonna make, we're gonna make that zero for the entire company. In order to do that, he started tracking things. Like he wanted people to start tracking the amount of incidents that went wrong. Uh, he wanted to track, um, you know, which processes were causing the accidents. And he was able to actually get the number to zero. And then as a result of that, it turns out the product started, you know, the company became very profitable because people were able to actually work more quickly and get those things out the door. Uh, the reason why is because trying to collaborate on the shared goal of safety, it was a pretty good idea from on his part. Like aluminum manufacturing is dangerous, right? And with people moving quickly, they might not be working intelligently. And one of the adages that I like to follow is, especially with doing anything complex or dangerous, is slow is smooth and smooth is fast, right? So at Alcoa, by focusing on safety, it forced everybody to slow things down and create a smoother, safer process. It also gave Paul O'Neill indications into things like when accidents were occurring, and another indicator he uses, when did accidents almost occur, right? That let him start re uh, prioritizing resources to look at those things. So not only did he satisfy himself with reduced errors, but also in order to get to, to no errors, he started looking at like, when did we almost hit it? Like, when did those things look? That was just an example of kind of continuing to look for those things. Um, and that was able to create that, again, slower, smoother, faster approach to delivering products, which is really relevant in the technical space when things are very complex uh, and people just start coming in and turning knobs and making changes and it can feel really chaotic uh, and dangerous, especially if you, if you feel overwhelmed because you don't know the information. But oftentimes the thing I, I tell new engineers when something goes wrong is it's like, let's slow down. What's your idea? What, what's going wrong? Why is that going wrong? Why does that, why would that cause that? What change are you trying to go through? Before you try something else, finish that out. You know, get that done, all right, then move it on. And if you go slow and you move through it, you usually wind up understanding the process better. Results of understanding the process better, you usually wind up finding the problem pretty quickly and then figuring out ways to, to make sure that, that that problem doesn't happen again. Uh, we've already talked about redefining failure uh, a bit. So this is just a quote from someone at Netflix. Uh, which is DevOps must allow the, uh, the innovation that where people can take risks. Um, and as a result of you know, the speed at which DevOps is occurring, uh, allowing risks just must be okay because you're going to have more things fail in production, but that's not a, a bad thing. That means just more work's being done. And as a result of being able to get to production faster, you're also going to be able to you know, relieve those things before they actually have an impact rather than them being like infrequent major outages when things go wrong. One of the ways to create those safe environments so people can experiment freely without having to worry about breaking everything uh, is to just in inject failures into production directly. So there's lots of different tools that can do that. and They all have awesome names uh, like Chaos Monkey or Bees with Machine Gun or uh, I wrote Similar Army with Simeon Army. I'll fix that. Um, all of these can be used to just create periodic failures. So does anyone know what Chaos Monkey does? The one from uh, Family Guy, right? Well, I mean, the, the, the meme that I'm looking at is, but. The memes from Family Guy, but the yeah. Chaos Monkey is a tool from Netflix. So in Netflix, um, so Netflix is hosted on AWS, and in AWS there's different regions. Um, like which are geographical regions that represent data centers in which your application is hosted. And Netflix is served everywhere, right? Uh, 
what they need to be able to do is figure out if any one of those regions were to go down, any one of those data centers were to stop going down, how would that affect their service and their ability to continue to serve traffic to their customers? So they've actually created a tool that will go through into their application and just block traffic from an entire data center, right? One of these massive AWS data centers. And then just as a result, they'll go through and they'll, they'll know when the thing's activated, but they'll, they'll basically look at their error logs, look at what went wrong and figure out ways to mitigate that so they can handle periodic failures, um, which is kind of cool and kind of crazy, right? It's like, oh, what if we just like tried to see what happens if the car just lost a wheel and we had to keep driving? Like that's, that's basically what they do. Uh, and then they built a better car that could keep driving. Uh, hopefully it drives a lot better with four wheels, but you know, that was the idea that they, they went with. Bees with machine guns, uh, just to, to, I guess, list out the tools is uh, uh, basically something that simulates DDoS attacks. So denial of service attacks. Uh, it just launches tons of resources in an AWS account. And then you can point all of that at a single individual server to just simulate load against uh, any individual service. And that's just a way to like, just test whether or not your, your service will work at scale. There's lots, lots of other similar things, but this one's an easy way. You can put anything in there. It doesn't have to be an individual access request. It could be file uploads. It could be um, submitting a form. It could, it could be a lot of different things. Uh, and then Simeon Army is actually just the suite of tools that Chaos Monkey is part of. There's a, a few other, like there's Chaos Gorilla um, and some others that just simulate other simulate other types of outages, like possibly like databases getting knocked out and, and, and things I'd like say that. Say, is Chaos Gorilla just caused bigger damage than Chaos Monkey? <laughs> I think Chaos Gorilla is like an entire region where I, I think that uh, Chaos Monkey is just an availability zone, which is like so it is bigger data center <laughs> versus like every data center on the East Coast. <laughs> like, yeah, I think that's it, but I. I could be wrong. I've actually only used Chaos Monkey. I've never used any of the other ones. The um, next version will be Chaos King Kong. There's like a bunch of different chaos. There's a, all sorts of simian chaos things in there. And they, I encourage you to go and read up on how all those things through. And this would be a great thing to add into your papers when you're talking about building and resilience, and like what you learn from those tools. Netflix has great DevOps tools, by the way. If you're looking for information on it, that's a great place to look. They have good blogs about what they do. You've noticed they're in these books a lot. It's because when you go to a DevOps conference and Netflix guys show up, like usually at these conferences, everybody's got like t-shirts and cool stuff. The Netflix guys are just sitting there in their hoodies, like chilling in the back with like a sticker that has Netflix on it. They're like, what? Everyone's just trying to ask them questions. They're like the celebrities of DevOps. All right. So the last one is creating game days, which we talked a bit about. Um, you know, it sounds like you, know, you, were, you, you did those a bit, Emilio, at your company. Um, and we've also, you know, I've talked about how my company does them internally. Another fun one I actually have had a, a chance to be a part of is the AWS game days. They do these at their big reInvent conference. Uh, this one was really silly and it was appropriate for like everybody on the team. So you could bring, like there were like teams that had CEOs and DevOps engineers and developers on them uh, that were working on this. And what it is, is they basically give you, um, a series of gamified scenarios and they give you some of the tools so you can launch your infrastructure and launch your, your marketing uh, informatics stuff. And you, they create this thing where like you're basically simulating Black Friday using this unicorn rental service. So you've got a service that you need to rent out unicorns and your unicorns are returned every 15 minutes. You need to make sure you're ordering enough unicorns to stay in stock and you have to make sure that you're also able to meet the predicted demand based on that. So you can look at previous year's unicorn data to see what the demand might be. So you can order the correct amount of unicorns at any given time. Uh, and they give you like points based off how many unicorns you sell correctly, how many, like how many you have left over, but there's also big holes in the code everywhere. And then periodically they just have these like jerk engineers at ABS just deleting things. And so you need to be able to detect what's going on. Like, well, ours is working. We were doing really well. Like you start off with something like negative 18,000 points because every second you're not s serving the service, it goes down. And then eventually you like crawl your way up to a point where you've got like 10 to 15,000 points and you're starting to do well and you get up to like close to a million points. 
and then they just cut out the service and then you just like watch your number go back down like to like 10 or something it was it's really really traumatizing uh but kind of fun and it actually you know what they did is something that happens really frequently which is they simulated a, a bad deployment to aws that knocked out uh basically like public routing of the service and it tested your knowledge of whether or not you knew you know what could be causing it whether or not you can check the right logs and get the telemetry data but it was a great example of just kind of like pushing people from all these different walks of life and teams uh on there to just kind of like simulate what would happen if you were trying to launch and basically amazon on uh, on black friday it was, a, it was a pretty cool example of it And that's, that's all I've got for the slides uh, today. Does anyone have any questions on these? All right, I will stop the share and the record. Uh, let's see, let's make sure I'm stopping the record.